Let us continue in getting to know Jesus better. And we continue with uh, the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 2. And I want to read verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest any time, at any time, we should let them slip. So the first word is therefore. It refers back to what we have read in the previous chapter. And um, it is a con continuation of that. So what was in chapter 1? It has proven that Jesus is the Son of God. He is superior over the angels. And he is uh, more than all the prophets uh, that had come before him. And so therefore... We now must look at the consequence of this. What, what is the consequence of this? What do we do? And the answer is given right away. What do we do? We have to give earnest heed. That means not only hearing carefully, but also acting upon that which we hear. And after all, it's God speaking here. Remember the first uh, word in um, Hebrews 1 verse 1. So, <clears throat> he, has he has spoken through the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, that you, uh, the reader, uh, which is uh, primarily, uh, first of all, the, the Hebrews, but by extension, of course, us, he, God has spoken through the scriptures that you know. Now it's time to take heed. So it applies to all that have heard the word, all that have heard the word, Jew or Gentile. And there is urgency to give heed. Because what is the consequence if we don't? It's also given here in this verse, lest eh, otherwise we should let them slip. We, should, we, we would drift away. And this, this word that is used there for to, to drift away, to slip, it is um, something that is inevitable. That it's like um, when you have snow on a roof and at some point the temperature rises and it will, it will slide off the roof, it will slip off. Uh, there is nothing you can do uh, to prevent that. Of course, you can put a fence so that it won't fall on your head, but I'm just saying it, it, the process is, is, will happen. Um, look at this question in Acts 16, verse 30. It's um, where um, um, the prison guard um, speaks to, um, to Paul and Silas when they are freed from prison. It says, uh, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And we see a similar question on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 verse 37. After Peter has given his sermon, uh, the audience, a man in the audience says, Men and brethren, what shall we do? It's a similar question. They've heard the word, they've heard the gospel basically, and the good news. And so they say, what now? What shall we do? And in both these cases, there was an answer. Of course, we can read that. We know. There was something to be done. There was a step to be made. There was a decision to be made. And that would have been very different if the question would have been the other way around. If the question would have been, what must I do to be lost instead of to be saved? What must I do to be lost? Then the answer would have been very simple. Nothing nothing you don't need to do anything to be lost doing nothing is enough to be taken by the current of this world and drift away it's very much like a ship in a harbor if you loosen uh, it's uh, the ropes with which it's um, uh, bound to the to the the quay then at some point it will drift away it's it's inevitable this will happen and so therefore we must take heed. We must take heed. It continues then in verse 2. 
For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape, if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. The main point in this section is the rhetorical question, how shall we escape if we neglect so a great salvation? And the answer obviously is, we won't. If we neglect such a salvation, we won't escape the, um, the reward, the recompense of that. And it begins by giving the word that was given by the angels. It says here that means it doesn't refer to um, the message that we read in in chapter one that is given by the son it refers to the law because in the jewish uh, tradition um, um, they, the jews agree that the law was delivered to moses by angels and we can find a reference to that in acts 7 and also in galatians chapter 3 now, and the law was taken very seriously by the Jews. And remember, again, the primary um, audience of this epistle are the Hebrews. They were very serious about the law. And so, if this uh, word that is given by the angels is taken so seriously, then how much more seriously should the word delivered by the Son be taken, who is far more superior than the angels, as we saw the last time. And notice here something else. It uh, doesn't say um, uh, rejecting the salvation, but it says neglecting salvation. And there is also a, a, a difference there, because, well, actually, most of the Jews had done both. They had and rejected and neglected it. but. Many Christians today, even, they profess to have accepted the gift of salvation, but then they neglect it in most of the daily life. So it's not, uh, not just a matter of, of rejecting it, but more, and certainly after that, after you've accepted it, of not neglecting it. And, and yeah, again, most Christians uh, are there to say, neglect their salvation most of the time and it's not just called salvation but it's called so great a salvation now if we indeed consider something to be great then we will pay then we will pay attention to it and we will not neglect it thus uh, in reverse if we neglect something then we apparently do not consider it great we do not really understand the gravity, the value of it. Our salvation is great. We are saved by a great Savior, God, the Son of God, higher than the angels. And we are saved at, great, at a great cost, the highest possible price. And we are saved from a great penalty, death and eternal separation from God. The Lord had spoken it. Again, see verse 1 in chapter 1. And it was confirmed by eyewitnesses. And even God himself bears witness through miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, as is mentioned here. So there is no reason to deny it. There is no reason to reject it. And there is certainly also no reason to neglect it. Let's continue in verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. 
So very interesting here in verse 5 it says that God has not put this world or the world to come into subjection of the angels. I mentioned it also last time, dominion is given to man. We can read that in Genesis 1. And we see here that it, this does not only pertain this world, but also the world to come. And then we get uh, a literal quotation from Psalm 8, where it speaks about uh, what is man, that thou art mindful of him. And this actually shows the smallness of man uh, compared to the greatness of God. And even though he's a little lower than the angels, God gave the dominion to man. So, as chapter 1 proves that, uh, from the scriptures, that Jesus is superior over all the angels, now Jesus' humanity is demonstrated. The text says that God put all things under subjection to human beings, to man, and that he left nothing that is not put under him. So Jesus exercises this authority as man. Let's continue, verse 8. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. We see that um, the promise of Psalm 8, to put everything under the dominion of man, has not yet been fulfilled. Not all things are subjected to man. Actually, we forfeited our dominion, just like Esau did for a bowl of soup, and we did it for a bite in the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. But, says verse 9, we see Jesus. The promise is fulfilled in him. By now it should be clear who this is all about. And this is actually the first time in the book of Hebrews that his name is mentioned. Jesus, after all this proof has, has been given, based on scripture, based on the, on the knowledge that is present, now Paul uh, deems it uh, safe, inspired by the Holy Spirit of course, to actually mention the name. Now he has the full attention of the reader and he knows they will, they will um, keep their attention even after hearing this name. After all, Jesus was the one they had rejected. It says about Jesus, we see Jesus. We see him. It's not theory, it's reality. We see him present tense. We see him now. Not with a natural eye, but with the spiritual eye. We can see him. The eye of faith. And the name given... Of course, Jesus in, in English, uh, Jesus in Greek, but in Hebrew it's Yahshua, uh, Yehoshua. Shua, which is salvation from God, from Yah, from Yahweh. And it does not say we can see Jesus, although that is true. It does not say we have seen Jesus although that was also true for many people, uh, certainly in the days that this was written, there were still many eyewitnesses around. It does not say, we shall see Jesus, although that's true as well, but it says, we see Jesus. We see him now, and we see him continually. He is the center of our life. And here in verse 9 it says, he was made a little lower than the angels. This means there was a change. He became man. He was higher than the angels. He was made a little lower, like any other man. And so the promise of dominion could only be fulfilled through a man. And so the atonement of sin by replacement sacrifice could also only be done by a man. Otherwise, it would not be a valid replacement. He tasted death for everyone, it says. And now he is crowned by glory and honor. Here we see the gospel. And it continues then in verse 10. 
for it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, uh, saying, I will declare my, thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. So those who are sanctified by him, those who are brought to glory, he calls brethren. And this is yet another indication that he is human. He was human. And he brought many sons to glory through suffering, it says. And it shows that real love involves sacrifice. It's God's love for us. It was expressed in sacrifice. We read this, of course, in John 3, 16. And God could not sacrifice unless he became man. And this verse that he brought many sons to glory through suffering also resonates with the Jewish people, certainly in those days, because of what is written in Isaiah 53. Now, nowadays, it will not ring this bell by many Jews because they, they don't read Isaiah 53. It's called uh, the forbidden chapter. They skip it on purpose. Of course, this is the work of the devil because this, this points clearly to Jesus, this uh, chapter. But uh, sacrifice... Um, was only possible by God by becoming man. And um, David understood, King David understood this principle of uh, sacrifice and of a price very well when he bought the, um, the threshing floor from the Jebusite. And this is in uh, 2 Samuel 24. I want to read this. It says there, And the king, that's David, said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, my God, of that which doth cost me nothing. And so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. Sacrifice comes with a price. Otherwise, it's not sacrifice. So next, Jesus is called the captain of our salvation. And that's a reference to... Um, to the army, yeah, to soldiers, and um, in other epistles of Paul, he makes also this um, this comparison. Uh, he actually calls us uh, soldiers yeah, that are uh, fighting in, in obviously a spiritual battle, but he makes this same comparison. Here, he calls Jesus the captain of our salvation. What does that mean? What is a captain? in a, an army unit. A captain is the one who makes the preparation for the march or for the offensive. And so likewise Jesus makes the preparations for our progress as Christians. A captain also commands the troops. Jesus commands us. And a captain leads the way and is an example to his men. So is Jesus to us. And a captain encourages his men. Jesus encourages us. And finally, a captain rewards his troops. Likewise, Jesus rewards his followers. And it continues to say that he was made perfect through sufferings. Now, to make perfect does not mean that anything was lacking or that he was imperfect before. Yet, until he became man and suffered, he could not become the leader of his people's salvation. This had to be made full. Um, that, that's why Jesus says at the end of all this, it is finished. Verse 11 then is an amazing statement that we easily read over, but we really have to think of this, uh, this whole section of course, but uh, this verse is amazing. It says, he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all of one. So sure, if he became man, then we are all of the human family. But he was a perfect man. And now we can become perfect in him. So much so that he is not ashamed to call us brethren. How awesome is that? 
think of it. It's not remarkable that I am unashamed to associate myself with Jesus, but it is remarkable that he is not ashamed to call us brethren. That is amazing. It's even more amazing if we read then what follows, that he stands in the midst of the church, his church, declaring the Father's name to his brethren and singing praise. And this is a literal uh, quote from Psalm 22. Psalm 22, which is of course a messianic psalm where uh, it's, it's, it's Jesus speaking from the cross. And we have actually some, um, some very specific details about the crucifixion in this psalm, although it was written long before crucifixion was uh, uh, performed. But it's quoted from there uh, that he will be singing in the midst of his church, uh, in the midst of his brethren, singing praise. And uh, we don't often think of it, uh, probably, uh, and it's maybe hard to imagine our Lord singing. Um, but we can read in Matthew 26, verse 30, that uh, after uh, he had the supper with his disciples, they were singing together. How must that have, be, have sounded? Ever thought of that? The Lord's voice filled with true emotions. Every word he would sing, he would feel the full depth of it. It's hard to imagine, but it is this kind of intimate fellowship that he desires to have with those whom he calls his brethren. And the question is, do we experience that? Do, you, do we experience, experience him in the midst of the church? Verse 13 then says, Behold, here I am, and the children whom God has given me. And this is from Isaiah 8, verse 18. His people are precious to him. Are precious to him. He, he is not ashamed to call us brethren. The question is, is he as precious to us? Then we read verses 14 through 16. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He shared in the same, that is, flesh and blood. He had to in order to go through death. Not only did he deliver man, but he defeated, defeated the devil, who thought that he had power over death. Satan had tried to kill Jesus. He had tried it when Jesus was just a toddler, yeah, through King Herod. And now he thought he had succeeded by having Jesus convicted to death uh, by Pilate. And the devil and his uh, minions must have rejoiced at that moment. But the devil did not take Jesus' life. Jesus laid it down himself. No one took it from him. And with it, Satan was defeated. And so was death. And Christians no longer need to fear death. And so for that purpose, Jesus did not become an angel, but a man. Even, says the seed of Abraham. And that resonated, of course, with the Jews. It was for them. It was for them. And I would say it was for them too, because it extends to all men. Yeshua, their Messiah, had become a man and had died in order to redeem them. It was everything that the prophets had, had foretold. It just happened in a different way than they had expected. And it's the same thing even today. It all ties back to the beginning of this chapter. Don't neglect such a great salvation. But give it earnest heed. We have to act upon this, upon this knowledge. God, the Son of God, far more than angels, was made a little lower 
than the angels and became man, our elder brother. And so he was made perfect through suffering. It is salvation from God. Yahoshua. Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.